Hey everybody, today I want to follow up the lectures on the digestive system to talk a little bit about nutrition and how it is that the food is used by the body. Now, understanding metabolism is a really big topic and it's the kind of thing that we really don't get to do much of in A&P, but I want to be able to unpack this a little bit so we can talk about how this affects the way that the body develops in the places where our foodstuffs actually go after they've been ingested. So the beginning part of this maps on to the end of the digestive system lecture I did before. And then, but then it's going to kind of talk a little bit more about, um, you know, kind of how this is used for maintaining core body temperature, as well as at least to think a little bit about human athletic performance. Now, there are, um, lots of ways that a lecture like this can go, but I kind of streamlined this in AMP2 because, you know, for people who need nutrition for a graduate program as a prerequisite, we offer a whole human nutrition course. And a lot of the metabolism stuff is things that are also covered in biochemistry. So I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of either of those because for the people who really need it, um, there are other whole classes that are focused on that. This is um, kind of where the what the SLOs look like. And you'll see that some of these are coming from particularly 167 to 170. Those are really coming from strictly out of the textbook. But the other um, objectives that I want to throw in here are largely from this really wonderful book called The Flexible Phenotype um, that I read a few times with students and really like thinking about. There's a kind of cool organismic and evolutionary biology questions that it handles. But anyway, first things first, when we are thinking about metabolism, metabolism is like the sum total of all the chemical reactions that occur in the body or in any cell, but we're going to talk about the body overall. Now, we can think of these as both catabolic reactions that are going to be breaking apart large polymers into small monomers or the anabolic reactions that build the smaller molecules into big ones. So, um, Remembering which one is anabolism, which one is catabolism is helpful. Um, I always remember anabolic steroids builds you up. So anabolism are the um, reactions that are going to cause uh, large structures to get constructed. But we spent the last few lectures talking about the um, elementary canal and what happens there about the different kinds of catabolic reactions that are going to be breaking apart large molecules from food into Food into molecules that are going to get used either as raw materials or as sources of energy. This graph, sorry, this figure here is mostly showing the, um, you know, basically like where the energy goes. Um, this doesn't really talk about, I mean, it does a little bit about building up proteins or glycogen, etc., or, or triglycerides, but um, those, that little stack of uh, colored in boxes with the chemical reactions, those are kind of where we think about these and like the energy going ultimately. So food comes in through the gut and it gets sent to the cells of the body that are then going to work with it either by building up stuff, either by building up themselves or by use by breaking down those raw materials for energy particularly with like two main currencies, you know, regardless of the type of food, things are easily e either going to get converted into peruvic acid, um, you know, through glycolysis, or it's going to get turned into acetyl-CoA, you know, even more or less directly. Um, then that acetyl-CoA is going to go into the mitochondria where it's going to get broken down to produce ATP. Now, if we remember back when life was really simple, we were you know, back when we were talking about how we fuel um, muscle contractions, we talked about the different. You know, we talked about these three main pathways by which it happens. Um, direct phosphorylation, I tend to see as being more important for muscle fiber contraction, but the ones that have a more general applicability are the um, aerobic and anaerobic pathways. In both cases, we have um, you know glucose is taken in, and then that glucose is going to get split by um, by the cell within the like within the cytosol and then you get a couple of ATPs for that but if you and then and the pyruvic acid would be a waste product at that point but um, pyruvic acid can then if the, if there's oxygen available go to the mitochondria to be able to um, you know break that down for a much higher number of ATPs to get produced 
And then from there, uh, and of course, waste products are different here too. In the case of the anaerobic pathway, the lactic acid is a waste product that's going to make the blood become more acidic, but it's, um, you know, it's going to at least get it out of the cell. Um, in the case of aer the aerobic pathway, the main, one of the main waste products is carbon dioxide as well as water. And the CO2 is also going to make the blood more acidic um, because of, you know, the, how much of it gets turned into uh, carbonic acid, either in the plasma or inside the red cell with um, carbonic anhydrase. But where I'm going with this is we see foods of all types being brought in, but as far as energy is concerned, those metabolites, those breakdown products of the polymers are going to turn into ultimately only a few different kinds of chemicals that are going to get used by, for energy um, in the cells. So I want to take a little diversion here to talk about metabolism and how it's measured. So we um we have we have a lot of information about how it is bodies use up energy um based on experiments that have been done with animals and people on treadmills or even i like that lower picture just dudes chilling out and watching television um but to understand what you know how much heat is given off by a body how much of how much uh, carbon dioxide gas or other kinds of waste gases are produced by a body over time and Using this, we can, um, we've been able to do a lot of work. Scientists have been able to do a lot of work to understand how it is the body um, not just runs itself, but particularly in the case of mammals and other endotherms, figures out how it is that they're able to keep their core temperatures high. Now, I think we talked before how one of the reasons why we start applying enzymes, digestive enzymes to the food, like immediately upon digestion, upon ingestion, is because there's, uh, the clock's kind of running if you're going to be endothermic, because we're constantly using up energy, um, whether we're like sleeping or doing something active. So this is a super energy intensive way of life being an endotherm. If you're an ectotherm, like a, like a lizard or a snake or a fish, they, um, you know, they just have different opportunities in their environment because they're because of their ectothermy. Ectothermy is a pretty um, efficient way to go, but it doesn't mean you can. It means it's hard to be active at night. It's hard to be active when it's really cold. So some of these animals have different behavioral adaptations that they have in order to be able to stay active. But mammals and birds, we just kind of throw a lot of energy at it. Now. This kind of confusing diagram, I actually might recommend that you take a minute and sort of get yourself oriented, pause the video, take, get yourself oriented to what the different stages are here. Okay, now that you're back, look at the, um, what these, these bow ties are showing, the ones that I colored blue. Those are showing these like rate limiting steps. There is, if you look up toward the head end of things, where, where, the, uh, where the food's going in at, at, um, at section A, that bow tie is to say that, you know, there's a certain rate that any animal can ingest food. You know, you, there, that's not something that can be scaled up infinitely high. Similarly, at bow tie B, that's showing that there's a certain rate at which food is able to get absorbed by the gut. Um, and even that, that the width of that bow tie might be narrower based on um, how much, uh, you know, basically how food, how fast the chyme passes through. Um, remember in the cases of, you know, because your digestive system kind of lives in the now, if you're in a situation of kind of clearing the decks after a large meal, then that's food that um, when it comes out all watery, that's also food that tends not to have been, had a lot of time in the small intestine to allow for um, nutrition absorption. What so basically what this is showing is once the food comes in, the gray is kind of representing biological molecules. Once the food comes in, there are a few places where it can go. We can use it for, we can use it for anabolism, right? Storage of fat, production of glycogen, you know, or, or for growth. Um, protein, you know, either for building up structural molecules or protein for building up the, um, you know, enzymatic arsenal of a cell. Um, now, what happens with, in addition to that, what's kind of showing in the metabolism part, where there are the, um, the pink boxes that I colored in, those are showing basically where is it that broken down molecules energy goes, you know? So in some cases, this excreted energy, that's showing um, basically waste products that are, um, that are that'll, they're going to get released by the gut, um, you know, particularly like 
no, no, sorry, waste products that are going to get released by cells as a result of their metabolism, or this exported energy. That's an example of, um, particularly for like nursing, if you are, you know, what happens when in nursing mothers is they are producing the milk which has in it a lot of stored energy that's going to get used by the baby um, so th that's considered exported energy which is different from work which is kind of shown down at the bottom work is you know largely muscular energy of moving food inside the gut um, moving things with skeletal muscles you know uh, locomotion all that kind of stuff and at the bottom there one place where we see a lot of waste heat getting produced is in this total heat production now, this is good because part of where our internal core temperature comes from is from this, you know, kind of waste heat that's produced by muscle contraction. Um, so when we are kind of moderately active, that can help to be able to regulate what our body temperature is. But what that means is going to be different for different air temperatures. Um, before I do that, though, um, a little bit about how kind of like why fasting diets, why like starvation diets don't work. So here this is showing a few different graphs that are stacked over the um, time course of a fast so we're showing either you know looking at the amount of you know proteins that are going to get um, used fats that are going to get broken down or body mass overall so usually at the beginning of a fast um, body mass goes down pretty quickly and it does that through um, you know, largely through the loss of fat. So, um, you know, which is which is okay. That's kind of what the goal is, but it does start to kind of plateau off. Once you get into that middle phase, that phase two on the diagram, that at that point, that's when the um, stress hormones start to pull in. And then stuff like cortisol and aldosterone are going to make it harder and harder to be able to lose mass because the response of the system is that it thinks that you're in starvation so you want to be able to you know stave off starvation altogether um, so it kind of plateaus in that little phase there but then there's in that leading into that step three this is when things really start to go haywire so body mass um, will actually go up near the end of that but it's not doing that because of um, because more foods coming in it's doing it because of the bottom panel because as you get closer to death that's when the cells are starting to deconstruct themselves in order to get used as energy so that store like stored structural molecules or stored um, you know proteins that were say in sarcomeres like myofibrils those are getting deconstructed um, but as cells get rid of more and more of their complement of enzymes, it means they're going to stop be able to function and stop living. So the um, most people who you know are not going to be in through that phase two and three. But um, certainly this is just to kind of throw on that um, stress hormones will try to stave off. Um, the the catabolism of proteins as long as possible until like until desperation and that desperation phase happens there in that like last phase of this now one of the things that was understood in doing these metabolic chamber experiments was understanding how much metabolic energy it takes to maintain the core body temperature um, so this graph is showing air temperature going from freezing up to wicked hot and is comparing core temperature here measured in the rectum and then metabolic rate. So let's do the bottom part first. So the bottom part is when the air temperature is really low, the core temperature also kind of dips off down low, but um, within about... You know, if, and this is an animal whose uh, who's like typical body temperature is going to be pretty close to ours. Um, you know, it's sort of, by the time you get to 10 degrees above freezing, um, you're at a pretty stable flat area there. The, and then later as the core, as the external air temperature goes up higher and higher, then the core temperature also starts to go up. Okay. So, but understanding what this graph means, we'll have to look at the top part too, which is looking at the metabolic rate. Um, basically, you know, basically the, um, how fast it is that the that oxygen and food is getting used in in you know per hour so when the air temperature is low in that zone one there you see that there's a pretty high metabolic rate so the body's metabolism whether it's through shivering or through other kinds of exported heat that's coming from muscle action that's going to that's going to produce higher than normal metabolic rates 
When you get into that um, zone number two, where in that green zone, that's the thermal, uh, the thermal neutral zone, where the body has to produce relatively minimal effort, relatively minimal energy to be able to maintain your core temperature. So this is you know just right, neither too hot nor too cold in that zone. But then once you get above that, the metabolic rate starts to increase, not because of energy that's exported by muscle cells, but just because you this is like you're um, just almost like you're heating up the whole solution just due to the air temperature. So this is chemical reactions, like those collisions among molecules happening faster um, just because it's hotter out, not because we are trying to use this for enzymes. So we're going to start to look at more at like denaturation of proteins at this point as well. So when you look at a graph like this, this is a classic what's called a Scholander curve. What this shows is high metabolic rates when it's cold in order to warm yourself up. Then it flattens off in the thermal neutral zone where it's pretty easy to keep yourself at a comfortable temperature. And then metabolic rate increasing again, but not because of any effort of the body, but because of overheating from the environment. Now, that zone one, that left part of this graph, is going to have, they're going to have different, um, different slopes there, depending on whether we're looking at animals that are accustomed to being in colder, evolved to be in colder environments or not. So in this graph, this is showing um, data that's, you know, we're looking at data of uh, metabolic rates of different kinds of mammals um, when they're under cold temperatures. And it's comparing um, a selection of Arctic mammals with a selection of tropical mammals. So what we see is, and in the, so we have on the, on the x-axis temperature going from negative um, 70 C uh, up to, you know, probably 40-ish uh, degrees C altogether. Um, and then this percent of BMR, that shows how many times their basal metabolic rate, the body has to push out energy. So look at the weasel in the, kind of in the middle of this graph. What this is showing is when the weasel's at negative 10 degrees centigrade, just below freezing, it's got a relatively flattish kind of curve, you know, in front of metabolic rate. But, it, but at that temperature, it's putting out about three times its basal metabolic rate that it would in its thermoneutral zone in order to keep its body temperature up. But if you look at the polar bear cub, also this is showing like with the extra, the um, dashed lines are showing the extrapolated ones. This means that this actually hasn't been measured um, which kind of makes me wonder why the white fox is on here, but it's been extrapolated based on assuming that it's a linear curve, uh, assuming that it's a linear relationship. So, you know, the weasel isn't too different from the lemming, but like your polar bear cub or the Eskimo dog pups, those have, those are able to warm themselves up much more efficiently. You know, so the Eskimo dog pup is putting out about twice its basal metabolic rate at negative 70, but the um, but the weasel is putting out about twice as basal metabolic rate when the air temperature is at about 20 degrees above freezing. Now this is of course for a lot of reasons. It has to do with, with coat thickness. It has to do with um, other kinds of you know metabolic adaptations. But this is basically showing that Arctic mammals are are more efficient at being able to maintain their core temperature in colder environments. So like the sloth, for example, that's a um, yeah, that's a pretty lousy curve there. It's actually, it's going to pound out about, you know, 300, about 300%, about three times of its basal metabolic rate, um, you know, when it's at a pretty high, you know, air temperature as well. So um, anyway, so I just wanted to throw out that this curve, though we see the Skolander curve shown in the inset up in, in the upper right, um, that's typical for people. But we can, uh, and we, we've observed these in lots of different kinds of mammals as well to understand how they work. To change gears a little bit, metabolism in a lot of ways is based on efficiency. One of the things that's the hallmark of natural selection is that the body needs to be, or not just the body, but any structure is selected to be as efficient as possible in order to, um, but not so energy expensive that it's going to be, um, you know, your, to your detriment to have to be able to fuel. Now, we can consider how much energy, how much like metabolic energy has to go into different biological materials, if, particularly if we think in terms of what are called safety factors. Safety factors tells you like how much stronger a structure has to be than it, you know, in order, to, you know, than it, than for its typical use in order to prevent failure. Um, I like this graph because this is showing, um, 
We'll do the left side of the graph first. So these different engineered structures. Um, for example, if you look at the cable of a, of, a, of a slow passenger elevator, this isn't to ding like any of the buildings that we're in, but like an elevator that's the, that's the um, you know, that's like the speed of one that you'd go to at 73 Tremont or in Somerset. Um, those that's that's what that's a slow passenger elevator on the other hand the fast passenger elevator that's like if you go into the top of the prudential tower or um 500 clarendon or something like that so notice and so whenever you go into an elevator there's always a little sign that shows you what the um you know what the what it's rated for and so if you walk into an elevator and the maximum weight given is like say 2500 pounds you know if you look at the slow passenger elevator, the true weight that it is actually rated for is actually more like seven times that. You know, so the what what you're so the idea here is that you want to make this more you want to make that cable tougher than it has to be because if it fails, the cost of failure is catastrophic. The reason why the cable the fast elevator is even higher than for a slow elevator is it's the difference between, say, falling three floors in an elevator if you're in Somerset or falling 60 floors if you're on if you're on the Prudential Tower. So in for, for structures, for any of these now, for any of these structures that have really high safety factors, we should interpret that as meaning that if they break, it's catastrophic. So we try to overbuild them to prevent them from breaking. Now let's look at the biological molecules, too. Um, there's biological structures. If you go like way down at the bottom there shell of the squid almost isometric with what you'd expect it to be for what it has to do drag line of a spider like super easy to break but that's also like part of what the deal is with it with the actual use of the um, of, of a spider you know tree trunks kidneys um you know about four times tougher than they really need to be um the what's shown here in like the leg bones of horses this is showing you how frequently different bones are broken. It also shows you, um, it kind of spaces out a little bit, how, you know, how more, how much overbuilt the proximal limb bones are compared to the distal limb bones. If the femur or the humerus breaks, that's the end of the game for for a horse. But if one of the phalanges breaks, um, that's not that's not going to necessarily be deadly. So as a result, you end up seeing these, you know, the, the more distal structures that are less critical for survival, having lower safety values than what we see for the proximal limb bones, which are much more critical. This is actually something that was done by Henry Ford. Like Henry Ford sent his engineers out to junkyards to look at old muscle um, Model T's in, and to see basically which kinds of structures were always in good shape. You know, they looked at steering wheels, they looked at axles and stuff. And one of the things that they discovered was this one structure, which I can't remember right now, that always was like in great shape. It was, I think it was like the axle bearing or something. So the response to this was to say, was say okay, that thing is way overbuilt because we're throwing away ones that still have good use in them. Basically, build me cheaper ones. Because what you don't want is to like, you know, what, a, what a body would be selected to do is not to have structures that are like left on the table. You want to have as much, um, you want to have, you want your body all to kind of wear out at the same time. And, you know, if, let's say, if everybody died with kidneys that had another 20 years of life in them, then that would be like wasted energy. So this, when we think about the economizing of life, I think the safety factor is really illustrative for thinking about that. And again, way up at the top, my old friends, the teeth, they are so overbuilt compared to what they really need to do ordinarily, because if, like I said at the very beginning of the digestive system, if you're unable to bring in food and break it down, that's going to decrease your efficiency of your enzymes, which is going to super decrease the possibility that you have for bringing food in. Anyway, the... Now, the thing that's interesting about this, so if we're talking overall about safety factors, we see that there are some kinds of structures that are going to be relatively overbuilt or relatively underbuilt from like what their set point is. And uh, there are different factors that can go into this. So, um, for example, the factors that increase the set point value, you know, basically how variable is the load? What's the, you know, what's the deterioration that it would have over time? Um, what would be the cost of failure? That's mainly what I was talking about in the last slide. You know, how flexible the, um, the structure is in terms of its function. So those things, if they're really important, if those things, if it's, um, 
you know, if deteriorating you, the ability of your liver to be able to process food is, you know, you know be able to detoxify your blood um, goes down. And that's going to be something that's going to be very detrimental to your lifespan. So those things are going to tend to cause those structures to get overbuilt. On the other hand, there are lots of factors that are going to decrease the set point value. You know, if they are cheap to make, if they're cheap to maintain, if they're cheap to run, um, you know, any of those, these sorts of characteristics, those things will tend to, you know, basically if it's easy to make new ones, then they'll, they'll tend to be built more cheaply. You know, they won't have as many safety factors in it. So if you look at the cartoon on the right, um, I'll let you pause the diagram, uh, pause the recording for a second and then um, start up again when you're ready. If you look at that diagram, what you see is the structures that have higher set point values are the ones that are tend to be pretty old. You know, your cerebral cortex, the teeth, um, but you know, or in some cases the bone, but not blood cells, not the gut epithelium, etc. Because some of those things are like cheap to make, they wear out, and then you make more. But the other structures, like your visual cortex, your cerebral cortex, cerebellum, you know, whether we're looking at the nervous system, but also some of the, um, you, know, you know, also some parts of the skeleton, um, that's more difficult to be able to construct um, after damage. So we, we amp up the safety factors. This diagram sort of talks about like what the economy of energy and the economy of oxygen is like in the, you know, in the body. So there are a few main stops along the way that we've like covered by this point. So, you know, so this is showing the structures are shown down on the left hand side. So starting off, we have like the you know, ventilation that's going to bring oxygen in, you know, in through the lungs into the cardiovascular system, that diffusion is and then the heart's going to pump it along, blood vessels are going to transport it out to working cells. And then let's say if we're in muscle tissue, for example, there are um, different, you know, different targets for where that oxygen is going to get used. You know, this is all in the case of making ATP, but not everything that a cell does has is like equally oxygen hungry. You know, synthesis of proteins, relatively cheap. Um, running ATP aces for doing ion transport, that's a little bit more expensive, but actual muscle contraction, that's going to be further more, ex uh, further more expensive. So, one of the things that respiratory physiologists and other metabolic physiologists look at is basically the different steps in what's called the respiratory chain in order to understand kind of where the overbuilt parts are and where like the less overbuilt parts are. If we consider metabolic rates, <clears throat> I'll take a break here. Core temperature is measured through the rectum. <laughs> Yeah, that's deadly. <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk now. Yeah, body temperature measure through the rectum. <laughs> All right. Now, this is showing another kind of mix of actually measured data and... Um, in the things that, but also spans a time when this might be relevant. So we're looking periods of time along, and that's kind of dimensionless, but basically shorter periods of time towards zero, longer periods of time as you go up on the x-axis. And then the, then this is also showing how much energy is expended for you know, compared to your basal metabolic rate. And again, your basal metabolic rate is like you hanging out like reading a book or you hanging out sleeping, um, probably in a metabolic chamber. So... For example, if you look at sustained metabolic rate, sustained metabolic rate, um, it's got to get sustained for weeks and weeks. So it pro that's why like the relevant line kind of goes to the right, goes off because it goes off to months and years. But that's like your, um, you can think of that as you know, something to be a little bit closer to what your, you know, a little bit lower down than. If you look first at your basal metabolic rate, that's shown at like 1.0, okay? So that's measured, it tends to be measured over the scale of hours, particularly when you're like sleeping or reading. Um, your sustained metabolic rate, that's five or six, that's like if you're working, how, um, you know, how much, about how uh, much energy you're able to export from work. So, um, you know, the sort of five and a half or so times your basal metabolic rate, your hanging around metabolic rate, um, is something that you can maintain over a, over a series of weeks. Um, 
the difference between summit and maximal metabolic rates. Um, this has to do with kind of body temperature versus if you're exercising. But if you look way up high, um, this this particular book this came from, they spent a lot of time looking at uh, migratory shorebirds. Um, seeing how, you know, you can convince a bird in a wind tunnel to fly for hours and hours, you know, at, at, a, at a BMR that's like nine times what their baseline rate is. Sorry, at a metabolic expenditure of about nine times their, uh, their basal metabolic rate. Um, the long curved line going down to uh, at maximum sustained work level, I think like that's like your Hulk your Hulk data. So like you can be super active. You can flip over that Buick if we're looking at something that happens over the course of a couple of minutes, but that can't get sustained for very long. So um, that's why that, 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 that big long line kind of decreases. So what's interesting about this is if we consider extreme tests of energy use, you know, most of these are different kinds of cycling races or road races. Um, and what we see is if we consider like how much energy it takes to fuel a body through that, these more workaday athletic competitions like all pale compared to the catastrophic Scott Polar expedition. Um, so Walter uh, Falcon Scott was um, you know, made an attempt on the South Pole. Um, he was um, beaten there by Amundsen, the Norwegian, but he um, but his guys, you know, they were like dragging like all these geological samples with them. So they were tugging these heavy sledges and they didn't bring dogs. One of the things that Amundsen had recommended was that uh, these guys bring dogs to haul the sledges, but they decided they weren't going to do that. It was just going to do it with, with men. And these guys produced, you know, well, they probably, you know, consumed um, you know, close to a million um, calories of energy. And, you know, and the thing is these guys starved to death, but they were eating freaking seal blubber for weeks in order to, you know, just when you think of how long it, the amount of energy that it took to be able to maintain their core temperature and then also to, um, and, and also to do the work of, of pulling these heavy, pulling these heavy sleds. So in some ways that, that expedition stands as one of the pinnacles probably of human metabolic expenditure. So on this last slide, I want to reflect on that a little bit more to see like how speed in and like levels of athletic performance you know do they plateau off here we're looking at average cycling speed for the tour de france from the beginning of the 20th century up to basically the present and one of the things that we see is there's this progressive increase in speed that happens either through better training through better equipment through um, better nutrition, but also we see where the EPO is, 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 um, is pointed out, where it is we start seeing um, erythropoietin and other athletic performing drugs um, start becoming more common. So we see that kind of, it looks, it kind of flattens off, say between 1955 or so up to until about the late 80s. Um, and then it starts to, you know, creep back up again, and uh, which is probably you know, artificially uh, induced, a, uh, induced a little bit. The average speed is pointed out as being low in a couple of little places there because one of the things we saw was with um, high with higher speed, um, we started seeing more people being killed on the track. So um, the average speed slows down because everybody's got to slow down when the um, when there's an accident. But the take home message from this is there is some kind of. You know, as bicycles and training got to a certain level in, say, the 1960s, that the average speed kind of flattened out until they started doing something to change athletic performance, saying something about the muscles, particularly with performance-enhancing drugs. So anyway, that's a kind of another aspect of understanding how metabolism works. Um, that's what I got for here. In case you're interested, um, yeah, the flexible phenotype is actually a really interesting, super um, um, readable evolutionary biology book that is worth reading over. Um, that's what I got. Let me know if there's anything that um, you want to give me feedback about.